Hello friends, DJ Lance Rock coming at you and I'm here at the incredible Vortex Dome in downtown Los Angeles. Look at this, how great is that? Tonight, I'm gonna to be interviewing a legend in the field of hip hop and a legend in music in general. I am talking about the one and only Chuck D of Public Enemy. So sit back, relax, and enjoy us for this conversation here at the Vortex Dome. It's gonna be awesome. Hello friends, this is DJ Lance Rock and it is my pleasure to be here with hip hop legend, artist, author, activist, and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, the one and only Chuck D. And somebody I met years ago in St. Louis in the STL. Oh, in the STL, indeed. STL means St. Louis. And it's funny, we'll get to that later, but uh, I grew up about eight minutes away from Ferguson. Oh, really? Sure did. That yeah. makes sense. Sure did. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I was there. Rivertown. We were like, we live in Florissant, so it's right, right, it's Ferguson, Florissant. Yes. So, and I was there visiting that night. Oh, really? I was. Wow. Yeah, so. A lot to talk about here. But first of all, um, I wasn't sure about mentioning that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing because I know that you, as um, an artist, you came out with an agenda just to kind of speak the truth and, and, and reach all people, but specifically black people with your art and just try to inform them about what's going on. So I don't know how that, how do you feel about being inducted into the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? It's great. Um, Public Enemy, we, all, we come from DJ culture, musicologists. We come from the 60s and the 70s, 1960s and 1970s for you, this generation people. Um, that was last century. So uh, we played all the musics from the Beatles to James Brown. And so knowing these records and knowing the musicians from the Eagles to Earth, Wind and Fire, it made you know about the engineers, the record companies, the artists, the labels, and therefore Public Enemy and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame coming from DJ culture, it was, a, a, it was an easy look. So our 30 years of contribution in, inside music, we tell people rap music and hip hop is music, part of the music Absolutely. industry. We're musicians as well as DJs and rappers or MCs or singers. Music is music. Right on. No, I just want to know how you felt about it because, I mean, I it's think it's great. cool that well, you guys are in there, but... It's great. You play baseball, and if they tell you you're in the Hall of Fame, and all you did was, like, you know, was a relief pitcher, you, you take that. Absolutely. If you're a catcher, you know, like, I'm in the Hall of Fame because I was the best catcher. Well, Public Enemy is one of the best hip-hop groups in music, so... Without, without a um, doubt. You know, it's not about all the musicians competing against each other. It's like your category. That's our category, hip hop and rap music. I feel you. The place was Run DM, uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, then Run DMC, then the Beastie Boys, and then us, and this year NWA, and um, hopefully next year people like LL Cool J, KRS One, and Tribe Called Quest, De La and Soul. De La Soul, people like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, I also want to ask about that. Um, you mentioned NWA. Yeah. They had quite a... a Nubians with attitude. Yes. <laughs> they had quite a, a year of um, raised awareness for a lot of people mm -hmm. here. And uh, that uh, film, that biopic straight out of Compton was uh, pretty exceptional. And it did really well at the box office. It was of a great EPK. <laughs> Electronic press kit for, for some of y'all. And, um, you know, it also showed, like, not just in America, but also globally that a, a black-driven film has an audience for it. You know, yeah. you got to sometimes tell your story. You can't wait for metrics. And, and um, I would say business uh, people to actually make the call on what should be culture. Yeah, that, that is a problem. But seeing how well they did, is that something you guys would think about doing? Like telling your story, the public enemy story in a biopic? I don't make movies. They had one guy called Ice Cube who makes movies, so that, makes, that, that made that transition kind of easy. And then also F. Gary Gray, who's worked with them. Absolutely. So yep. that's different. I mean, I'm not in the movie or Hollywood industry or television industry, so okay. if it comes my way, it's got to be, it has to really turn me on because yeah. I don't really care. 
No, I know. That's the great thing. I know you've done like narration for a lot of different things. And well, stuff that's my like job. That. Narration, yeah. music projects, artists that we have. Uh, we provide services and, and technology, the internet. And, um, you know, was there at the convergence of technology and music at the turn of the century. So, um, you know, that area. Uh, if I had to be envious of somebody like the Jimmy Ivey and Dr. Dre, how they just took over iTunes, that was really my area of work. I, you yep. know, I kind of like, Look at it and say, "Wow, that you know that should have been me, but should've, not the movie." Aspect. You, you are Prince. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, but but not the movie to. industry is its own animal. And it is. Ice complete. Cube's been doing movies for a long time, so he was deserving to be at the helm of of, of that okay. Hollywood film statement. I mean, he was in Burn Hollywood Burn um, on Public Enemy with Big Daddy Kane, who also did a few movies. But I don't really choose to do movies. If I could put music in movies, it's great. Fair enough. You're setting me up real well, because speaking of Burn Hollywood Burn, the Oscars. Yes. You know, um, they should have played that song instead, maybe. That yeah. wasn't their choice. I think that it was more like they knew that they had to get some kind of um, control to Chris Rock. So it was Chris Rock's theme opening and closing. And why not? You know, no, everybody ain't mad at Chris. I'm not mad at Chris at all, at all. I didn't yeah. watch the Oscars. So I didn't watch it either. I would so. have to watch. To me, I'm like, I'm not in Hollywood. I'm not in the film industry. So to, for them to pick their favorite film has nothing to do with me. You know, I know what my favorite film was. It's Straight Outta Compton was a great watch for me and also The Martian. So whether it's Compton or Mars, I was down with it. Why not? I didn't need anybody to pick, the, pick my favorite. Well, that's, that's kind of how it is anyway. That's, that's the, that's, goes into the bigger issue of like what you mentioned, what you call the core plantation and how um, all these corporate entertainment industries kind of handpick or they kind of try to dictate what we should consume. And yeah. I know you've been a real big advocate. You have RapStation. Yes, dot com. RapStation and what? Spit Digital Distribution. I think that, uh, I, I think if you want to make it fair, I think independent should at least have 25% of the total wheel and still have its, its niche and pocket of influence, which is important. And the corporates are going to always come in, but to dominate 99% of the space, take 99% of the revenue with 1% of, of the goods, to me is crazy. It is crazy. Well, how did you guys navigate that like you guys always seem to be above that you were on you know it's called um don't spend money you don't have <laughs> so see that's good advice for all don't spend money you don't, don't spend have. money you don't have what you don't know you have to pay for so you have to kind of learn things yeah, and learn absolutely. how to create out of nothing and start from ground zero so all of our artists have that same motto um, they, they, they're great, skillful people. They have a great time doing their work. And they try to understand that one counts, two counts, three counts in that order. Not trying to come in with a spreadsheet and figure out how they do 179,632 on their first week. Uh, that, that's and none of that should even matter, you know what I mean? Like there used to be a time like, you know, in the 70s, like you mentioned, like, you know, you know, Asylum was, was kind of revered, you know, like when David Gaffin had like Phoebe Snow, she had like six records before anything even happened with Poetry Man or something like that. Right. Are you used to be able to have an artist just find their way? And it's like, okay, well, it took a while, but now we got Linda Ronstadt or Jackson Brown or whoever they were trying to develop right. like that. And now it's like, if you don't come off the gate with something, you, you're going to be struggling. Well, I think all of them are struggling. Every single artist is struggling because the, the industry has changed underneath them. I mean, 16, 15 years ago. Um, I think we're in a singles marketplace, but also I think that artists performing in small places is very important. So maybe new venues have to open up with a bar, the cafe, uh, the place that, that wants to model itself after Starbucks. I think stages for the millions of artists out there are very important too, not just locally, but globally too. Local is very important. If a local artist got, if they can make a living in their own, tri-state area they can get to these places without much expense right, right. Yeah, but they gotta make a living they want to make a living and it's helpful for artists to know that they can add five to ten to fifteen thousand dollars on to whatever they do in their life and i think that's that's the that's the new business model is that you got to figure out how 
a million artists share as opposed to like oh these are the three artists that they're going to see you're going to see everywhere right that you're going to see at the super bowl and they do the same artists all the time the ones that get the radio spins and they pick the same 20 artists when there's millions of artists out there now so we I like agree. to have services to support artistry we encourage artists to have their own record labels we distribute electronically and aggregate through spit digital distribution we're having a lot of fun with it and we also have rap station which has 12 uh radio station channels right that curate properly so curation is important so chuck i was asking you with your label do yes. you pick the artist yourself do you do the a and r how, how does that go about uh it works in a combination we have we have a staff it's it's spit slam which works like electra asylum i got heroes like uh Barry Gordy and a good friend of mine, Jack Holzman, who started Electra. So oh, yeah. I kind of like take the old ways and also add up to new ways where you have curation. Uh, Kate Gamble is my assistant. She works a lot of electronics uh, through uh, social media. And a lot of the artists that we choose are people who kind of like are doing their own thing and having a lot of fun. And we try to figure out how we can enhance that. And that's probably the best thing. It's not, if somebody doesn't know what they're doing and they need help to try to figure out how to start, we kind of like wait a while on that. We kind of like look at artists are kind of like 30 years and older too. So we kind of let people develop and we tell them to have their own labels. And if we get interested when they're developing to a point where we can have a conversation with them that makes them feel good about themselves, then we'll, we'll move it into our uh, label distribution with a affiliation, so. That's great, and I think it's really important for people to remember that kind of indie, kind of DIY. Yeah, yeah man, and, and independent. You know. um, but, well, we feel now independents have to, kind of like 360, they have to do it all. So our yeah. services of knowing that we can have our own radio stations, our own video network, our own L record label combinations, even our news team. I mean, our news teams go out and we make sure that they cover our artists first. You know, I no, mean, that's, can, that's, as opposed that's to putting some it. music out there and say, we're looking for somebody to give us publicity. No, we, we, we started all in house. Great, 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 great. Um, just real quickly, just something I used to listen to your show when it was on Air America. Oh, okay. You know, and that was, that was, that was a really I had a great, great, great time. Rachel Maddow and Liz Winstead and the three of us in, in the morning, East Coast at, um, well, it had to be really early for you because it was early as hell for me. It was like six. six o'clock in the morning yeah. for you? Yeah. Yeah, I nine o'clock uh, and me and I had to go from Long Island where I'm from and we also have a house and get on the train and get on the other side of Manhattan and get in there at, well, I would say 8.59, but it, well, it usually <laughs> was like 9.15, you know. It happens, it happens. But uh, those were some great times, and I know you've done other stuff like that, but uh, yeah. was there anything that you learned from that? Like, because like, I mean, I, I really was rooting for them to make it, and they, 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 they fought for a long uh, time. Well, one thing I learned, that the, the downside is that you can have black content, but they realized that, I realized for the first time the racism in radio, that they said no matter how the black content is, you can't get a, a all black or black sales team to sell black content to America, the United States of America. I was like, duh. They said, yeah, they won't accept it. So even when you see all these situations and it looks like it's a black package or black music or whatever, a black sales team can't make the sale to the United States of America in business. So the, all the underlying layers of racism, you know, rear their ugly head when you talk about radio, television, film, the politics of who sells who what and who puts what away is um, something I discovered even more so while at Air America. Progressive radio at its finest. Yeah, I mean, Rachel, <laughs> Rachel went on to MSNBC. Yeah. And she's, yeah, she's I, I used to call her, I said, you are the Edward G. Murrow of Air America. You are going <laughs> to higher places, girl. And, it, it, and, and um, myself and Liz really feel proud about that. Liz Winstead is one of the people that helped launch yeah. Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. um, a, a very uh, progressive pioneer in her own right. And me and hip hop. And then Rachel, I mean, was just totally like, you want to talk about somebody who, somebody who gives 300 percent, 
and 23 hours a day. You, people see her for an hour, but she puts in 23 hours oh, a day. Tell. I don't even see how the girl sleeps. I can tell she's yeah. real focused. She's one of the, the, the greatest of all time, uh, in my opinion, as far as workers and committed. She's That's not going to make a mistake. Um, but that's the thing about it. a lot of people like get real angry because she says stuff and they try to argue, but they no. can't argue with the facts. No, that's you the are thing not, about it. You, you are not like winning. Her a, you're not winning an argument with Rachel Maddow because she is totally committed in examining the fact from every single angle and every single side. So when she actually got on television. She, I mean, she wasn't making no mistakes at Air America, which is on the AM dial <laughs> in New York. So knowing she's going to be on blast on, on international television news, uh, she's putting in 26 hours in a 24-hour day. She's on point, definitely, definitely. Yeah. But getting back to what you said, what you learned. So you, you said that you realized there was, uh, like, such inherent racism in the radio it was industry, racist but... policies and in the institutions of, mm -hmm. of, of sales and radio and television and stuff like that. And they didn't budge because that was the way that the business was run. And at the end of the day, the, how the business is, is run and what it brings in and how it brings in dictates the flow of the company. People had to get paid. So even if you come up with a different flow, this is how it should be. If people's checks are bouncing. <laughs> you're going to get unhappy campers. So. Absolutely. So begrudgingly, that was just the way it had to be. But don't time. you feel like that's kind of inherent in a lot of other aspects of the industry as well? In the United States of America, of course. Yeah. I mean, it goes, with, it goes with the cowboy culture. I know about the cowboy culture. Cowboy culture comes in. They say, well, you know, we're going to come into Missouri. <laughs> they came into Missouri. We're going to come into Ms. Lou. Thank you, Lewis and Clark, but we got different. Misery is what right. we call it. <laughs> right, we got, we got other ways that we're going to look at Missouri other than making peace with the people that was here before. So, the cowboy culture. It's, it's, it's prevalent here. That's kind of like, okay, let's see where we're going to go here. I just want to kind of... Um, <clears throat> I know I mentioned the Oscars again, but what I wanted to know is like, so how do you feel about any of these sort of institutions, like these award shows, you know, like I, what I, I get from you is that, you know, you're an artist, you're a philosopher, but you know, part of it's also, you're an entertainer. You have to go out and tour and do all this other stuff. So, yes. you know, that's a little part of the game. You know, I kind of have to do the same thing as mm -hmm. well. Um, you yes. know, but I'm trying to educate children as well as entertain them. So we know that's part of it, but I don't get upset about this. I'm not going to go and boycott the Oscars. I'm just not going to watch them anyway because I don't even feel that there's any relevance to me. And I know that some black actors in particular had spoken about, well, it does matter because that sets, that's the gold standard. But I, I just want to know how you felt about that. Well, I'm not going to diss anybody's protests. That's the business that they're in. And if they realize there's some inequities, then they have a right to protest that. Me, as a person not in that business looking from the outside in, I'm like, cool, that's your business, so you figure out how to fix that. I mean, I'm in rap music and hip hop, so I'm trying to fix the bias that's even in there. I, we don't have a hip hop hall of fame. Right. But somebody who actually got a lot of money through some techno, uh, technological merger, you know, ends up giving, you know, USC 30, you know, million, million dollars. dollars instead of a hip hop hall of fame, which is trying to raise two million. So things, I, and, and it'd be different if people, didn't build their existences off of hip hop. But you know, when things that, like that happen, um, these are things you wanna try to, try to fight that, like look, this, is, this gotta be like leveled out, I mean. Well you uh, fought a long time ago. We gotta have our own award shows. And then, and then you wanna hit the fan bases and say, look, you guys need to support the music that you say you love. And you, you hit the artists and the business saying, you guys need to support the fan bases with great public relations other than being on your whole high horse. I mean, you see metal holds it together. And that's what I was gonna say, because they, they came about the same time, because I know you were very um, instrumental in trying to get the Grammys to, you know, acknowledge yeah. hip hop as yeah. a category. Yeah, we gotta and, fight for it. Like, and, like and the guys in, uh, in metal, they fight for it and they kind of consolidate together. But then that comes out of just out of that culture of being with a band that the drummer, the guitar, the bass, 
Yeah. They got to kind of, and the other guitarists and maybe the keys, they all got to play together. In hip hop, a lot of artists believe the record companies too much to saying that the one guy don't need a group. But when you have too much of that, you have a whole bunch of soloists as opposed to, well, where's the groups at? Because the groups can, are exciting to watch because everybody has a different role. Just like a band with a bass and a drummer and a lead singer, or the vocal, you know, everybody. Well, when we were coming up, everyone had a crew, you know, that's how they had a crew, great, you had your dancers, you had your DJ, yep. you had your MC, maybe other MCs. And so that was exciting to watch. Watching one person, I think you got to be really, really super dynamic to get attention of being one person on a stage with everybody watching. And you got to be incredibly super dynamic and you have to be trained to hold people's attention more than a half an hour without running out of steam and not a lot of cats got that ability they're not they don't have that training and that's 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 the thing that i was going to say that i i've noticed because i know that you are a huge fan of james brown yes. and james brown yeah. definitely but you couldn't had, take your eyes off james brown you couldn't but you he couldn't. he had the discipline he he just you know was very focused and knew what he wanted to do and he got a band it's like we're going to rehearse we're going to do this and they were so yes. tight that he could kind of go and do what he did and, yes. and you were mesmerized seems like a shaman take your eyes not at off all. of James Brown. I've never seen nothing in my life where you couldn't take your eyes off the one person. That's a dynamic that really has to be ingrained into that particular artist. But he came out of, of a time where black artists in R&B and, and rhythm and blues before it became soul, mm -hmm. they played in places where if they did really well, they get two pieces of chicken. Oh yeah. If oh, they yeah. didn't do well, well, no, if they did okay, they got one piece. If they didn't do well, they got nothing to eat. So you, and you playing in front of an audience that might've paid two, three dollars and worked all week to get it, you might get cut if you ain't, if you ain't up to par. Oh, no, so. no, you, you had to bring it. You had yeah, to bring it. Yeah, you had it to bring it. So that's what that decade and all that time before, that's what it, 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 it that's what they had to do. They had to leave people awestruck for little or nothing. So the fast forward and where people could just think that you could just get up on stage and have 500 people on stage <laughs> all, all with a mic, it's like, you gotta leave the fan saying, wow. And that's where, that's where sports still wows people. People go there, they say, well, I like to play, but when you go to an NBA game or a high college basketball game, you realize you can't do that. <laughs> you ain't that magnitude, you ain't got, got that skill. Sit in the seat, watch, clap your hands and say, whoa. I mean, people talk about a Steph Curry or Kevin Durant, mm -hmm. you know, or Spencer Haywood back in the day. And uh, you can say what you want as a fan, but you ain't doing what they can do. And the same thing with musicians, but if music gets de-emphasized, it takes the, the little bit of the awestruck aspect out of it. And that, could, that gotta be worked on. I mean, there used to be a time like, you know, I mean, I don't know if you saw any of the, the, the Kennedy Center honors this year, but like when Carol King yes. got her award. Was one of my heroes, Carol King. And when Aretha Franklin came out, yes. I was like, this woman is in her 70s and she blew everybody away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Carol King could do the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, so um, when she came out, did Natural Woman, understand that record is written to the specs. To, to 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 take down a house and you got a singer that's going to come in and also take down a house absolutely it's they wrote like, it for her mm -hmm. and she came mm -hmm. and delivered and that was that's what was great she came out there and she's like i didn't do this that much she had her fur coat on sat down at the piano and killed like because you know you would know you would just think maybe aretha's comfortable she's just going to be chill but she brought it like this was 40 yeah, years ago yeah, yeah. and that's what i think is missing you don't have a lot of artists uh, not that they're not hungry, but right. maybe they don't even know. They they're don't not, have that training. They don't have the training. And number one, if you if you don't have the ability, which most people don't have, then you come together as a collective because your weak points should be somebody's strong points and somebody's strong points, you know, uh, your, your strong points should be somebody's area where they can't cover. That's what makes a band tough. Okay, and what about a band versus a team? Because it doesn't Same seem thing. like athletes athlete seem a to band be is a, team. a little bit more because like 
in in American culture, especially like you know, the sports, team is sports. Yeah, sports are just kind of the end all be all, and, and we really look up to a lot of right. athletes. But, here. but a band at its best and a team at its best is still the same thing. It, it, because even it, though it should be Chuck, it, but I don't know if it is. It anymore. is. Like, it you know, it I mean, is because no matter like look at a, a team like Oklahoma City. You could talk about Durant and Westbrook, but that's how they're marketed. And then they're marketed as, the, but really at the end of the day, they got to play well. The team around them got to play well in order for them to win, or they won't win. And, right. if, and if winning is supposed to be the top thing, then it's beyond marketing, you know. But if marketing is the thing, then you don't have to win. Well, the same thing in music. I mean, if you don't have to have the great record and you don't perform well, but you got hype about yourself, that's not a win. That just means that this is what it is. But at the end of the day, you got to win to keep people there for forever in perpetuity. And I guess that's what I'm saying. It's like, it seems like in sports, you have more athletes that are winning. It just seems like, I, I don't know. At the end mean, of the day in sports, Lance, one team wins and everybody else loses. True. <laughs> You're right. You're right. That's You're the right. thing about sports. You can say uh, they got the MVP, but did he win it all? No, he didn't win it all. True he that. ain't won yet. Okay. And so it's about a team thing. And you, if you, can, you. you can root for the individual thing, but it's not like boxing and it's not like tennis, but it, it, or it's not like golf. This is like a team thing. And, and music, it's went from a band thing to the individual thing. So you can root for the one person, but if he ain't turning you out, you ain't going to be there for more than a half an hour. And mm -hmm. one thing a performer cannot be, you cannot close out a show with 5,000 people and, and you can't close it out. You, you can't do 20 minutes. It's like, that's not gonna work. Which means you're not gonna play big spots and many of them now don't, no matter how big their record might be. Hype can only get you but no, so far. No, I, I, I hear you, I hear you on it because it's- Skills close the building now. Hype could get you in the building, but skills will take it down. Yep, I, I believe that. Um, what do you feel is the, 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 the current state of hip hop right now? Like, how do you, like, where do well, you? Well, the current state, I, I say we have to have more groups, more women involved, and independents have to be able to be more part of a program that needs to be supported by the media and the total curation and roundness of, of the art form. Hip hop and rap music is poorly curated. We have great artists out there, but the curation of people talking about the art, DJs that really tell the story and talk about the artists, they're lacking. Um, we, we lack television interview shows like this. We lack shows that used to be like on Soul Train where Don Cornelius talked about the artists Absolutely. At, the, at, the, at the end of performance. Every or, Saturday we get up and watch that and you would learn right, something yeah. It's like, Curation has never been worse. With so much access, the curation has never been and, worse. And that's something, and that's, that's, I was going to jump into that in a second about social media, but I kind of want to continue with this. So is there anybody that you're kind of feeling right now, or is it just the artists that you guys are putting out on your label? Well, Rap or? Station uh, has 12 station channels, and we curate thousands of artists, really hundreds. I would say hundreds instead of thousands because the curate, an artist, their music, their album, their songs, their label. You got to get thorough with the explanation of what it is. So you you could do it. Yeah, over a course of the year, there's probably a thousand that we do. But the records and songs and artists are coming out every week. So we get like maybe 60 new songs, artists, situations every two weeks, and we make charts. So we give a, a top 50 every two weeks and a top 10 every week. So there's, there's a lot of artists I'm impressed by from the old to the new. From a Bumpy Knuckles to a Cormega, uh, to a uh, MC Job B from, from Oklahoma City, you know, to Sammy Vegas who's on our label. So there's, man, there's a million artists great, out there. Great, and great, you, great. you can't get lazy either because just because it's a million artists out there don't mean that, ah, man, that's a lot, I don't want to, go through listening to all of them. You know, you have, then that's when you have staffs and teams giving each situation a listen and then a story. Sure, sure. And I think that's probably, that's the biggest missing aspect of rap music and hip hop is lack of organization. Well, I tell you in sports, let a young kid, 16 or 17, run a 9-1 
100 meter dash. The whole sports world will move in on that. Yep. So it ain't like they got more, uh, more, mu uh, more musicians than athletes. They got more athletes in high school, college, and the pros than they got you know, people that say, all right, I'm playing the guitar in my bedroom. Yes, there's a lot of artists that's on YouTube, a lot of artists on Bandcamp and SoundCloud, and used to be a lot of artists in MySpace. You know what I'm saying? But that doesn't mean people are all so many, I don't want to handle it, you know? It's all too many to listen to. No, there ain't too many athletes. No, you're right. It's, it's just a different way of having it organized out there. And I, I don't know, um, you know, I, I read something that you said a long time ago, kind of about, you know, the state of hip hop. And this was, I think, like 10 years ago. And you were just saying that a lot of artists really aren't saying anything except for let's go to the club and party. And then like, well, I, don't, I don't want to- That's subjective, you know, because- It's subjective, but I, I'm just wondering like- Going to the party is important. Having a car is important. Having a girlfriend, your first girlfriend is important. The swim part, it's important. But if 95% if, if of them say the same thing- That's what I'm saying. Well, you know what? It's not what I don't like. It's that the process of elimination will eliminate the bottom of the pack from that. If 95% of the artists are saying similar things, that means you have a body of artists that, that will cancel out. And they'll only say, well, the, the top 10% of that pile will right. acknowledge and everybody else wasted their time. So I tell artists, diversify themselves, pick different song angles, pick different aspects of a song, just to be able to carve your own ideological uh, niche. Now Chuck, I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions and if you don't wanna answer them, that's fine, but it's just, there's, certain things that end up being put out in the news and on social media especially and you know everyone wants to add their voice you know and everyone's got an opinion but yeah. you know you've actually been in the trenches and done stuff so i'm just kind of well, well i have a rule once over 50 years old do one social media one sock med s-o-c-m-e-d so i only do twitter my brother runs my Facebook. Somebody says, oh, yo, I saw him this picture on Facebook. I'll be like, I don't know what you've been talking about. I have no idea. I, I, of course, people that work with me, they go to Facebook. Kate set up, um, what do you set up, Kate? Whatever. Oh. My sister, I mean, my um, daughter runs, my, my mid-daughter runs my Instagram. I have no idea what's going on. Okay. I don't have anything. Yeah. Okay, I have, I have nothing to have. But I have Twitter. I am a, I am, I'm on Twitter. I saw your tweets. I'm, but I'm not a Twitter yet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or Stephen Colbert said you're not a twat. So. Oh, yeah, right. that's what he said. That was him, not me. But um, yeah, I don't have any social media right now. Uh, we're trying to get back. Uh, you know, other people are running it too. But uh, yeah. I don't really have a lot to to say to four year olds. I don't know how long they're going to be on the internet checking out stuff. So I would rather I only do have other one stuff. four year old I talk to all the time, and that's my my four year old. Exactly. And <laughs> trust me, she's running the the gamut. She's she's growing it. So one day she'll visit. Yo, Gabby. I would love uh, that. Would be one. Great. I mean, no. I mean, visit it on, in um, in the middle of what her desires are. Like, okay, I want to. She wants to come to Gabalan. All right, we'll we'll do that. All right. Um, well, here's the. I'm just going to start with some um, subjects here, and uh, uh, we can uh, take them or leave them here. Um, as I said earlier, when we were talking, that uh, I'm from St. Louis, and uh, the STL. I'm about my parents. My family lives about eight minutes away from where Michael Brown was killed over in Ferguson. And uh, there's just been a lot of um, opinions about this, how it went down and it brought up a lot of conversations about police brutality and how uh, black people are dealt with. And it, I mean, not that this isn't something that's been going on for centuries, but it just got a renewed focus because, you know, as ta Counts was saying that this isn't news, just the cameras. Like now everyone is getting to see it. So people who were like, that doesn't happen, does it? I'm like, yes, the cops pulled me over and put a gun to my head yeah. and accused me of stealing my own car. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. no one would believe that. A lot of people wouldn't believe that, right. but those things happen. Mm -hmm. And so um, how do you feel about how Ferguson has been handled in press and, and the subsequent string of uh, the media, at least, putting out the information of all these, uh, you know, police atrocities against uh, people of color. Well, the technology has come along with its own rules of speed. 
that the media was always slow on telling the story, the diverse story, because the media always tries or tried in television and areas that people had to pay for. The media was always trying to keep itself in the news and keeping itself in business, so they might have didn't have the time to be diverse as they're trying to figure out how they're the number one rated news. So they got to always tell a safe story. And telling the safe story in the, in the United States of America means you're going to leave a lot of people's conversation out of that lot. narrative. So media has come along and social media and on the internet that come along and say we got a more detailed conversation that you need to have and I don't know about your ratings but forget the ratings and so that schism of what media didn't tell about the diversity of this country and what the internet is telling you the diversity down to the detail of one person's blog converged into a um, into a tipping point so where you see a situation happen like Ferguson, the news is slow, but the internet blew up with a trillion opinions. And, and images then, that we didn't and, see. And images either. that you didn't see. I mean, a lot of these images used to have to get accepted. They were, you know, the people had meetings in conference rooms on which photo would represent the conflict area. So there was social manipulation in the old areas of television and radio and it was a business yeah, yeah well it necessarily wasn't a business when it came down to the internet and somebody's personal point of view you know rodney king still was filtered through the law but also filtered through media and then blown up because it was the catchy thing that people say oh wow there's a business model and our business model is eyeballs and ears but the internet which really matured in 2014 and 2015 as far as the usage of people using the technology necessarily didn't have a business model behind it to tell the truth it didn't it didn't cost and like the, the immediacy of it or that and baltimore was like okay you can say what you want to say on the news <laughs> but where you can say what you want to say on cable CNN and all that, all that slow. This is the immediate thing, and we're hot on it, and we're gonna get, we're gonna go even crazy deep and make our own decisions on what's the photo that represents, or the photos that represent, like Laquan McDonald, or the voice, you know? uh, right? Because that was that didn't ha that happened like a year earlier, and it just yeah. took a while to kind of keep pushing yeah. that. It's like, well, here's what happened. You, you know? can't, you can't ignore. Been, that could have been hidden. You can't ignore it, and 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 it came in in a in a tidal wave. A tidal wave of 200, 300, and then later 1,000, then 10,000, then 20,000, 100,000 correspondents. So do you think that's a good thing or not? Do you think there's like a just everyone should have their voice? Because on social media, well, it's a that's lot. what the law says. The law says everybody should have a voice, right? They, they should. I'm just asking. The reality of law and technology limited that voice or magnified a few voices. But what the internet did is it magnified everybody's voice to a point. And it no longer was the voiceless totally voiceless without magnification. Now the voiceless could be unedited. Yeah, there's and, a democratization there. And, and hard, to, hard there. to deny. Excuse me? Yes. There's a democratization there, for yeah. sure. These are deep, deep words for a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> well, then the next word here then that I was going to get into... Uh, the N-word. Oh. And, um, you know, again, just wanting to know your... Well, I said Nubians with attitude. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. Let's put it this way. Here's, here's the situation where social media kind of... They, they try to, you know, right. the court of public opinion. And um, when Gwyneth Paltrow was in Paris mm -hmm. with Jay-Z and Kanye mm -hmm. West, and they did that song in Paris, uh -huh. and she just tweeted, hey. Because she was lazy and she was ignorant. Ignorant she, didn't mean stupid. She was ignorant, so she chose, chose to ignore the magnitude of the word socially. So that's ignorance. That's ignorance, but my, my, the, my only point is that that is the name of the song, though, right? Right. Mm-hmm. That's like also saying the name of the song is F off. But you, you can't say F-U-C 
You know what I'm saying? Because in media, it has restrictions on bad language and it's tied into history and it's also tied into social ties. So if anything goes, you, you do need some kind of order somewhere has a line in the law has to be drawn that's somewhere. what i'm saying chuck Social. because you can't say f you on tv but you, you can you, say you. it on the internet that that's what i'm saying so it is kind of unfiltered there that that's that's what i'm trying to figure out where the Vassal, line to be drawn Vassal, is. well the line well it depends on the construction of the of of the particular social house by the participants and the citizenry of, of where it's being transmitted, which means that you gotta have adults sometimes know that they gotta be adults, understanding that there's a nation of younger people underneath them. That's the, I mean, look, I mean, people go and do one and two every day. Do you need a door in the bathroom or do you don't need a door? Can you do it in the street? So at a very early age, a, a person tells a child, you just can't do number two anywhere. You can't do, yes, you can, but it's not cool to do that. So in the same way, it's like, yeah, that word exists, but you can't say it everywhere. No, 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 I, 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 I But this is, what, this is what the narrative should be from at least curators, older people, and say there's a there's there's a right place at the right time. I guess and what I'm right saying right because time. of social media is kind of so unregulated. That's that's kind of more. Of a yeah, well, the, the air is, reg, is unregulated too. I mean, a, a bumblebee could come and sting you and kill you. You know, I mean, snakes, uh, rattlesnakes will come up in your backyard in some areas of the country. It's not really regulated. It's the world. So you have to explain the world. You know, okay. you have to explain the world to people who might not know the world. No, Same I, thing with words or titles or whatever. And, you know, yes, it it's ends in Paris on the Internet, whatever its form has got to be. But coming off of the Internet in a social conversation or whatever, you know, it, it, it's cool to truncate that because you don't know who you're talking to. Gwyneth Paltrow was ignorant to to the social constraints of something that's deep and heavy like so that. So you were saying she was a DFB? She was a DFB? <laughs> yeah, that's an easy way to say it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna wrap this up. I just had two more things and then we, we can we can we can bounce out real quick. I, I hope you like I hope this is cool. I'm just, just this is just the shit I wanted to just kind of ask you dude. This is yeah, I, 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 I like that. Well, we could we could knock this out one okay. more. Yeah. Okay. yeah, one more. <clears throat> but give me two seconds here, and okay. Cool. This will this will this will be it then. Um. <clears throat> Action. All right. Um. I also wanted to ask you about Islamophobia. Okay. And um. How do you? A lot of the rhetoric is definitely geared towards people of Middle Eastern descent. You know, I, I don't know how many people are directly coming after like Keith Ellison or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but do you see a distinction there? I, I, I don't know if it's like, is it just we don't like Muslims or we don't like Middle Eastern people, but we're going to put it on their religion or is it some sort of combination? It's the lack of knowing human beings and the diversity of cultures around the planet Earth and, and being locked into your own cubicle of thought. I mean, it's, it's, it's ignorant as saying that, you know what, there's a bias coming from the Midwest <laughs> about the Middle East. So you gonna categorize everybody in the Midwest for being ignorant about the Middle East. So, the language has to be more sophisticated knowing that there's, there's one race, is human beings. And human beings have their choices and they have their cultures. But if the United States of America does not have this in their school systems to teach you about the world and other cultures right, yep. and other choices, Absolutely. Um, then you're gonna have government have the final say so. And government can't have the final say so when it comes down to choice of religion and culture. And, you know, unless it's going to be protected. 
and um, when people pass judgment, it's usually based on what they don't know and fear of what they don't know. Very profound, very profound. Well, Chuck, um, I think we're going to wrap this up here, but what is in the future for Public Enemy and uh, Mr. Chuck? Oh, just to provide to be, my only goal is to be a service for artists and especially hip hop and rap artists or artists, independent artists, to provide um, curation, um, uh, talk about playing and projecting their music and um, also just being able to provide services for, for many artists that want to do this thing. Well, I think that's great because that's something I think that over the last four decades we started to lose a lot is that there used to be, especially like hundreds of years ago, there used to be like an apprenticeship. So right. a young person was taught a skill or a trade right. they learned and that knowledge was passed down or you had mentors right. that kind of helped people up and we've been losing a lot of that in the society and I think that's great that you want to give back and kind of keep spreading the message and uh, you know, well, just when, keep you, doing what you do. As a sports fan, you know that in sports people have mentors that teach them how to really play their position yeah, or absolutely. do that game that people think is a new game. The games have been, a, you know, 75 to 50 to 100 years old with the same uniforms and logos practically. Re, you know, we, well, we could do the same thing in music. Music has we a should. longer yeah. tenure. So we could understand how we got to take care of that with mentors and apprenticeships and uh, good blueprints and also faith in perpetuity. I'm glad you're going to be a part of that. Uh, most of my heroes don't appear in no stamp, and I'm sitting next to one of them right now. Uh, Chuck, it has been a pleasure, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, All DJ right. Lance. I'm DJ Lance Rock, and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.